Hello and thank you for joining today's LinkedIn Live hosted by Oval Edge. Today we're going to be discussing the top use cases for data governance. Um, my name is Kieran Allen. I am a technology writer. I work closely with the team over at Oval Edge um, to help them kind of manifest some of their ideas um, and put some of those ideas into print. Um, and I'm joined by Sharad. I'll let Sharad introduce himself. Hey, thank you very much for joining Overlight um, LinkedIn Live. Um, I'm Sharad Vashne. I am co-founder as well as CEO of Overledge. Um, um, I would love to discuss the, the entirety of the data governance and how the different use cases is going to help. Awesome. Well, Sharad, should we start with a kind of basic question, um, which is ultimately why? Why data governance? Why should companies be getting involved with data governance? Why should they care about it? And why is it so important now? So this is a very fundamental question, and I think it's a basic question people miss. People generally start with what is data governance, and, and I want to start with why data governance. I think this is a very good question. So if you see any, any technology, uh, whether it's a transportation technology, whether it's a, say, airline or anything, when the new technology comes in, there is always a problem about communication. So, for example, we are we are driving on the roads. So, if if we don't know that there is a, some person have to go right and left, there is a certain rules and regulations are there in order to properly use the road infrastructure. It all in order to properly commute. That is the governance structure is there. Imagine there is no governance structure, and then you will be going anywhere on the roads and the traffic's all over the place, right? So it is um, even the airline industry, right? So again, it's, it's a very basic concept. Airline industry have a different, they don't have red light, green light, but there is a there is a traffic controller, there is air traffic controller who, who tells, uh, you know, when to land. Sometime there is a, you know, uh, the plane is hanging over the airport for at least 10, 20 minutes because it doesn't have space to, do, to kind of land. So these governance structures are very important for any technology to evolve. And now data is still is a new technology uh, in terms of it's, it's coming up right now. People have realized the value of the data in terms of people have realized because, because of Amazon and Google and the cutting edge um, technology company have shown to the world that what the data can do and how much successful they are because of the data. Uh, if you watch a 20 years Jeff Bezos interview, he was talking 20 years before about data and how they were using data at the time of doing the recommendation engine on Amazon.com. So 20 years ago, they have started using the data and that's why they are here right now. So, so now it's become, data is becoming a survival issue for a lot of organizations. If they don't use it, then competitor will use it and they will become more uh, advantageous for them. So every company have to figure out how to use more data for their competitive advantage, whether to, whether to use operation, whether to improve the operational efficiency or to increase demand. So whether to increase their top line or you know, uh, reduce their bottom line. So either way, the data is used and will be used more and more and company have to figure out that. So since they have to create, they have to use the data in order to um, build new data products, do data things, they are they're building this data infrastructure. And so this new data infrastructure is coming up, which is built, started from Hadoop, now is going to the data breaks, data lakes, uh, you know, snowflakes and Teradata and <laughs> And there's too many technologies are coming up in the market which can host a large amount of data. Earlier, that was not possible. Now it is possible in, with the with the revolution in cloud with AWS and Google and Microsoft putting you know the big infrastructure together. People are moving all the data to the cloud, but people will not be able to use until and unless governance is there. Imagine this: all the roads are there, and there's no governance structure. Then people will not be able to drive the roads, right? So you need to have the governance structure in place in order to properly use this infrastructure, properly uh, uh, kind of com uh, communicate with each other. So there are various uh, areas, let's say, use cases of the governance are there. Kind of how to properly use this infrastructure, how to properly. Um, uh, kind of communicate, collaborate. There are various areas of the data governance, what we call it use cases. Uh, I would say that compare this, like if you go in with the roads, uh, do, should we drive left or right, right? Um, England versus U US, right? The different 
ways, but we still drive, right? The red light versus I'm stop light back. versus there are different ways of, of different use cases, how do you drive versus, you know, airplane. So this is the same way. There are different, different kind of regulation, different kind of policy building, different kind of um, objectives are available in data governance world to kind of achieve different objectives. And, and that's, we can talk about those objectives uh, about the use cases. Are. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely, that for me, that's definitely laid the case of, for why this is the time, you know, why, why now people really need to focus on governing all this, this data that's all over the place. I think it'd be quite interesting to talk about some of the practical problems that data governance can solve. If we could break down, um, what the basic problems are that organizations face when it comes to ungoverned data ultimately and how yes. what, what data governance does there very good so the, the first problem is really the siloed data right so the data is in siloed and uh, in multiple different technologies out there uh, whether it's a data lake or whether it's different applications so the data is in silo how do i use it right so that is the number one basic problem uh, then the second problem is generally around the, uh, the literacy of the data that how do I understand that when it's saying, uh, when something is saying the average quantity, is it, is it really average quantity or this is a price value, right? So is the metadata definitions are correct or wrong, um, as well as like is the right information is there. So because the large amount of data is there, so you need to be able to put together a program which is at scale. So the metadata inf information, the data literacy aspect of it then the second is getting access to the data because now you have large amount of data and uh, say for example there is a huge amount of PII information is there uh, which is governed by laws but there is a huge amount of uh, the internal information of the company's confidential information is there so for example let's say company salary information right you cannot share the salary information across the board but it's not governed by the law it's governed by your internal policies, right? Revenue number, or there are certain things which is uh, which cannot be disclosed. Although revenue number is maybe for public companies can be the public information, but at the transaction level, this information is not, it have to be governed properly because if somebody knows what is the revenue going to be next quarter, they can trade the value and then it will be insider trading, consider this insider trade. So there are for every number there is a, then there is a um, country laws country laws like france and say that you know france data ca can only stay in france it cannot go out of it so there are locationalities problems so there are various things around access of the data then the, the the third pillar is generally considered is, is the data quality you know when move data move from one system to another system to another system is the quality is consistent of the data and is how we make sure that the the the, the when the data reach finally to the end user, he can really trust it. Um, they can really um, uh, see this is a, a high quality data, which they can put a, a trading on it. They, they can put a, a bet on it. They can take decisions on it, right? So when they are using this last time, so for example, a company's health information is, is finally understood from its balance sheet or from an income statement. And if it's, uh, imagine the income statement is wrong. Imagine the balance sheet is wrong. Then whole trading cannot be done. Then millions of billions of dollar uh, trading happens on every day because of the data is so trustworthy, which is balance sheet and income statement, which represent the true value of the true uh, information around the company, because this is very highly regulated as well as highly governed. Imagine that every data, if, if, if the data is not governed properly then you will not be able to take decisions around it so there are three or four eight four five areas are there uh, which is like a data catalog which is kind of understanding that how which uh, kind of divide the data into uh, divide the silos and give you the one landscape of the data so data catalog is one use case which is considered the lineage impact analysis is considered as another use case to kind of understand where the data come from where it goes and kind of uh, use this the third use case is uh, data literacy. Literacy is built on data catalog and, and data lineage is a part of the building the data literacy, but also putting together a framework of communication together so that the consistent definitions are there, right? Uh, the When we use the data is trustworthy. So, so that is the third use case we generally consider is the data literacy. And then the data access management, um, that how do we give access to everyone around the data and then the data quality, right? So there are 
I, I think there are six use cases of, of primary use cases of the data governance in order to really use the, uh, properly use the, the data. Okay, so I think maybe the best thing for now is if we could maybe drill down into those use cases one by one. So if we, perhaps if we start with uh, the data catalog, um, it'd, be, it'd be good to know what problems they, that, that data cat catalog will solve and how it solves yeah. it. I think that's a good Very point. good question. Um, so data catalog is a, a representation of all the data inside the organization at one place. So the first thing problem it does is that I remember that I went to a very large consulting organization. And at that time, we, like, we were, I used to work for a consulting organization. We used to charge like $400 an hour per person, you know, for, for, and then we had like five people of five people team. And we went to this uh, organization and I say, hey, can we have the data so that we can start doing this? It took us three weeks to get to the data. And we were just not doing any work because we didn't have data so we can start using it. So it took, it took us three weeks to just get hold of some information. So that is generally a typical case for every organization to in just to figure out the, where the data is and how do we start using it, like, you know, so just to get a little bit hand on the data. So what data catalog does is that it gives you a one central place. Uh, it's kind of Google um, so that it's, it's become a, it's a Google of all the like Google is for all the websites. So the data catalog is for all the data inside the organization. It's a central repository of all the data with the uh, with all this information into it at one place, so people can easily search it, people can find out where the data is, and they can easily understand what the data is. Right? So, so that is the one use case for the data, uh, is the data catalog. The major part of the implementing, the major problems comes in the data catalog is, is that the catalog is, uh, there are two components of the catalog. One is the automation, which is like, like for example, Google. Uh, when Google crawl various website, it crawls it, and it put it in their engine, right? Now is their algorithm is so powerful that when you search something, it only give you the right and most information, like which have the most user information. Uh, in the enterprise world, uh, that algorithm cannot be as good as Google's algorithm is because uh, Google is built on billions of users. Even when Microsoft Bing and Yahoo tied up together because they can get more number of users together, right? So in enterprise world, the building that kind of technology is not is almost impossible because there are not that many number of users are there who can enhance that algorithm. So that's why the curation process have to be very good. So people have to uh, put their tribal knowledge, which they know about the data, into the data catalog so that they can get more and better information into it, right? So, so first is automation part, which brings the data from automatically from various data sources like reporting system, file systems, report databases, et cetera. And then collecting all the tribal knowledge into it and putting into this, right? So the curation process is the two, two important part of data catalog in order to really be successful in the data catalog. And once you have those two things, then it becomes easier to basically for anybody to find the data and understand the data because it's it's, it's now a lot of done has been done by automation and then you put the human knowledge into it it's become uh, very very good so that's what the data catalog is um, okay. and and it's used for like mostly finding and understanding the data and it's it, is, it have multiple use cases further downstream like it can be used by data analytics team to really understand the data to like i was a, a part of the analytics team it can be used by data governance team. It can be used also by business team to find various reports, where the data come from, to build the trust. So it is used by across and by the compliance team. So it can be used by multiple team together because this is one central repository because a human, so, so it's kind of a central repository for all the various teams to use the data catalog for their own use cases. I guess it kind of um, it almost sounds like the engine for data governance, doesn't it? It's like, yes. Like this kind of central engine and, and the other programs seem to feed off of what that catalog can that achieve. Is, that, is, that is absolutely right. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a one central engine. And without data catalog, the, none of the, 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 the use cases and something is very hard to function. Yeah. I guess um, moving on, we should probably look at some of those um, specific use cases that come out from this. So 
maybe we could look at data literacy. So data li literacy programs, how, how they work and what they, what they provide organizations with when it comes to governance. Very good. So uh, the data literacy is um, ensuring that business terms are consistent in the data. So for example, generally the data use of the data is used by business and, and business make decisions on this reporting system. So for example, uh, balance sheet is a very good example, right? So the, if you see the balance sheet, you get to the balance sheet. Now let's see that a um, lot of thing in the balance sheet is governed in the sense that uh, when we look at the all the part of the balance sheet, when we say EBITDA, when we say revenue, when we say income, I think everybody financial analysts know what it really means and they don't deviate from its difference. But let's say that uh, it's up to the company to company, depending upon that, how they want to report it, right? So for example, now new tech edge companies, they are also reporting new things. So for example, Twitter reported fraud rate, right? Um, they reported fraud rate, but they didn't report it the exact definition of the fraud rate. Now it's up to everybody to understand what the fraud rate really is. So when they reported the fraud rate, they say it's 5%. And based on that, the decision maker who is Elon Musk, bought the company they said okay the fraud rate is less than five percent i can kind of buy this uh, uh buy this company but when he asks what is the actual definition of the fraud rate they realize they surveyed 100 people and they find only five were uh fraud so the definition was not matching with the, based on their expectation which is the buyer expectation buyer must be thinking oh, okay there must be a comprehensive analysis to find out the exact fraud rate but it is their way of calculating the fraud rate, which is Twitter way of calculating the fraud rate, while their understanding is different. So while the the product, the, the person who have created the report or the data, which is the, the time of the, then what, how they are creating versus understanding part have the differences in understanding. When they have a different, it's the same concept of fraud rate. Like right? we will never know what is the actual fraud rate is. It's just how you calculate based on that you will come to know, right? So when you, as the new and new metrics and, and things are coming up in the, in, in order to do the decision making, it's very important to have a consistency of it. The first, the, this person and that person, the production, the person who is producing the report or the data and the person who is consuming, they need to be on the same page to get the proper understanding as well as the multiple department, multiple business unit in the company have to have the same consistency. Now the companies are buying an acquisition and mergers are happening. There are too many, you know, dynamism is there. So in order to have that, they, there have to be a, that, that, that's what the data literacy concept is to make sure that all the business definitions are consistent, accurate. And that's where I think that uh, the data literacy use case comes in. It, it is all about creating a, a unified business glossary which have that, okay, if I say that when, when I say fraud rate or customer lifetime value, it actually represents the true meaning of it. And everybody in the organization understand this is the meaning. And anywhere we use in, in any data processing, within the ETL pipeline in reporting systems, in anywhere in the data processing, we use this consistent definition and the formulas, which is represented by this business glossary application. So that's why the, this is a very important use case, which is we call it data literacy to, in, to ensuring the business terms are consistent in that in the area. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think one of the areas you just picked up on there in terms of the business glossary from, from when we've discussed business glossaries in the past and whenever I've had to include them, it's, it's such a crucial tool. And I guess if anyone's looking for a data governance tool, it has to have that provision there, really, doesn't it? it? Has to have that ability. Yeah, without business glossary, data governance is like kind of like yeah. You know, so data catalog is is again is the foundation for the data business glossary because mm -hmm. um, what happens sometimes when you're trying to create a business glossary, you need to really understand in the organization how many places you are using it. Mm -hmm. So suppose you are creating a customer lifetime value, and you you can define a definition from customer lifetime value, but you really do, don't understand the different departments are using how then the standard definition will not be able to propagate down in every department level. So you need to, when you are building the business glossary, at that time, you need to have a consensus, whoever is production, who is producing the customer lifetime value, as well as who is consuming the customer lifetime value. You need to bring all these people together 
and have a discussion with them that, hey, these are the, the, the these are the seven different ways we calculate it. You can cal you do it this way, they do this way, and then have the consensus in the organization and say, okay, this is the standard we will use now anymore, you know, now onwards, and let's correct these people and then find a consensus. So the consensus building is a major part of data governance process. Um, and and that, that's like, a it takes a time and effort because you have to correct your reporting system, the formula somewhere, wherever it's used, otherwise there will not be consistent. So that is the, uh, the building of that is a major part. Like housing them is a is a simple thing. And, and like you can create a definition, you can like government can decide, okay, this is the definition would be, this is a laws or something, and then everybody can follow, that's very easy. But for everything, like organization do it, the government cannot define it. Even the organization cannot define it if you see that because every department uses differently. So that is why building a consensus in the organization is a key part of the data governance initiative. Absolutely. So moving on to the next, um, the next program, um, I think many people might not be aware of the importance of this, but can we discuss data access management? That's a very, uh, another big use case of data governance. So uh, I think that data, what data access management allow you, because now when all the data is at one place, right? Um, just like um, let's say in data lake uh, or in central data warehouse or cloud data warehouse or whatever the technology is, right? When you put all the data at one place and uh, you want to provide access to multiple people, it's very difficult. The why it's difficult, uh, for example, if you if the data is in SAP or the data is in um, application layer, uh, like a CRM system, like CRM system already know that how many lead sales rep will get one lead, how many another sales rep get another leads, and, and people have access to their data only, right? People don't have access to other data sources, other data in the application layer. Now, when the data goes to the data warehouse or something, all the data is kind of naked. It's, it's have all this information. So if you give access to everybody, it's kind of too much data and they will, they will, they will get to access to the revenue, the salary and everything. So the big problem in the data access management is you have to put some sort of a security, some sort of access management on top of the data. The, the problem here is, is really not putting the, the role there but how do we define the roles? Because now there are millions of data attributes, not even thousands, there are millions of attributes. And in application layer, when we do it, in application like SAP, et cetera, it comes out of the box. Okay, these are the roles, you know, these are the HR rules, these are the rules. And it took 20 years to build SAP, if you think around it. It's come up with this business logic and processing. And every time the SAP is implemented in any organization, they take two years to implement, to figure out what the roles, what the users, and kind of implementation took it. Now, the same thing is happening in the data warehousing industry. And this one is a who should get access to what, right? It's a, uh, can I give all the HR information to HR? Or how, how do I divide and conquer, kind of like, how do I divide all these data, data thing? Is the problem which we want to solve in data access management. And uh, in order to do this, simplify this uh, and make it faster, what we have at Overledge is built is a methodology of classification of the data. So you can classify the data horizontally and vertically. Horizontally means by different department. You can do, okay, the horizontally is like, uh, you can divide by uh, HR, by marketing, et cetera, et cetera. And vertically is by uh, by classification is like is a generic data, is a PII data, is a confidential data, is a secret data. So you can divide that and then put different roles in different metrics. And that way it becomes easier to think about the data and about different different policies to put together. And then each each uh, matrix element of that have a different policy altogether. So for example, you can say HR confidential data. Who will get access to it? Uh, marketing um, um, marketing data, which is generic, who will get access to it? So now you can think about it. Okay, how can I divide it? Like, like for example, like this recent case of Trump, right? So does the top secret information goes to the president or ex-president? Like the same concept, basically, we are doing with the data. Now you can think about this and put your policies into this one. And now manage this policy 
is you need a tool to manage this policy because then now these this is a big matrix is coming up who should be the owner who should be the who should own this policy who should approve it if if somebody needs access to it so you have to put together a policy who should default get access and who should not defaultly get access if they need it they need approval system into it so you have to think through those kind of areas once you think through it you can easily implement it in the so that's what the access management is crucial to it fantastic um so should we move on to the final use case um it's hard to you can't really say which is more important than the other because obviously they all work so holistically but i think it's it's fair to say that without quality data there's no use in using the data at all so can we yes. um just discuss how data governance aids data quality how you can improve data quality with it and the kind of the, the core areas that are covered within that very good so the data quality is also a crucial component of um you know data governance um data quality is uh, is a is quite complex because uh, organization is moving from i'm sorry i got disturbance yeah so we were talking about data quality so data quality is a crucial component in the organization um, the problem is that there are too many data flows from multiple areas right so the data is happily going from application layer to warehouse layer to all the way to the reporting layer um, as well as ai engines and everybody is using it and where the problem of the data is it's hard to know and and uh, everybody blames on each other as well in the organization like they say okay application people say this is what the data is but most of the time the when the data is getting originated at the application layer there are a lot of issues in the data quality itself right um, everybody have and do not have a very standard processes of putting the data in the application layer first so when it goes to the downstream the data quality keep having the problem but in order to solve this issue of data quality what we at overledge we come up is three prone strategy one is proactively change the data quality systems so how do we uh, like proactively make sure the data quality do not have any problem the second is reactive so when anybody found a problem how do we fix it and third is third party data so third party like third party data is which you don't have control into it right so in organization a lot of places you do have control like how do we produce the data but in the third party is you don't have you are not in control so you have to put some standards in order to achieve the third party data management so there are three areas of that um let's start with proactive so proactive is is something that um how do i proactively make sure that data goes to the data ecosystem with with proper rules in place so you can put together some proactive rules based on different dimensions of the data so like validity like qual um, like uh, timeliness etc so there are different like six different six to eight different dimensions based on the different framework of data governance uh you can ensure that when data comes into any data platform it it validates against those dimensions to 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 enter into the data but the the problem here comes in of the scale uh because scale is the data is moving in petabytes into the data platform or in gigabytes or in terabytes and the and it's computing these dimensions is very expensive in terms of resource and processing power so you cannot compute each and everything and put all the rules in the data quality to kind of make sure that everything is good if this is critical data element like balance sheet or something yes you have to put a very comprehensive rules there but if the the rules are uh but if the if the data is log files or something which is not a very high business critical then you can't put those many rules in order to do this so for that you have to rely on reactive data quality reactive is somebody when company uh, when consumer or ex, or decision maker is consuming the data at that time there is report there is some sort of a problem here um so when they report the problem then the data governance team basically do the root cause analysis find where the problem is they prioritize the problem and after that they fix it and they put some sort of a control so that not happen again so that is the reactive data quality kind of doing make sure and together and third party is when you are buying the data from third party or you're getting the data from third party from whatever reason you have to put some sort of a control in place uh, in doing this so that a if you are in control to manage and force them they can change it you force them to send it back and change it in some cases you are not in control 
of third party, you have to receive what it is. So in that case, you have to clean it up and, and push it. So it depends upon the, the third party that what kind of third party it is and how do you manage with this data. So there's two different variations of the third party data management as well. So those are okay. three areas of data quality, which we kind of uh, kind of to understand that how do we solve the problem of data quality? Because such a major problem, there is a uh, uh, there is no one side fit uh, one size fit all strategy. This is a, sure. one of the strategy of fixing it. There may be other strategies as well um, to fix the data quality problems inside the organization. But this is we found to be more effective and works um, in conjunction with with the various technology which is available as, at this point of time. I think this ties in really nicely with a question we've had from one of our viewers, um, moving swiftly in the direction of data quality. Um, she would like to know, oh, she, he, he or she, pardon me. Um, please, can we talk about the top down versus bottom up approach to data quality? And is the best solution always to use a, a high, to have a hybrid approach to that? So again, um, the top down versus bottom up, uh, I think it depends upon, um, I would say that uh, proactive versus reactive. Um, so when we say um, a proactive, you have to do it at the bottoms up, like you have to do, look at the at the bottoms up level. And when we're talking about reactive, it's mostly like top down, uh, top down in the sense that because people are reporting the problem and that's coming from the, uh, but still I wouldn't say that again, the proactive reactive has a different um, way of solving the problem. Top down and bottoms up can be used differently. Uh, on the data quality, right? So uh, when we say top down in this, like, okay, uh, is do you mean by uh, by at the at the schema level and then at the reporting level, at the table level, at the column level? That is also top down. You know, just do it the, at the very high level and then go to 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 the bottom level. That that's. But the problem actually is at the bottom level. Then it comes to the top, right? The the so th there is a, either the problem. If we see the problem, problem exists either two places. Either there is a problem in computation. Computation means in the, in the ETL pipeline or, or somewhere in the processing framework. Or there is a process problem. When you're collecting the data, that is the problem, right? So the, the problem always at, at the bottom level, right? So the problem is always will be either you have to fix the, the process or you have to fix the data uh, ETL pipeline. ETL pipeline fixing is the easy thing because the ETL is the IT domain, but fixing the business processes require always a top-down effort because uh, in order to process, in order to fix the process, let's say that uh, you found that when the data is moving, that the, the, the balance of different uh, categories were different. So you found that the category was a actually is coming from one application use one category codes while another application use another category code. But when they consign together, it kind of have to be collide together. And as a category, let's say to understand easily, like country code. Let's say you, the one country is using USA, another another application is using US. Now, when you combine those together, now you have two entries. One is USA, one is US. They both mean to be same. They both need to be summed together, averaged together. But somehow, because the code is different, you cannot do it. And let's say that the country code is easy to understand this, uh, but the category code is, is difficult because there are thousands of category codes out there. right? So, so you have to have a consistency of the category code. In order to fix this problem, either you change one application or another application. And whenever the application which you would change it, they will have object to it. They will not like it. Let's say you happen by merger or acquisition or something. It is there when you need a top level, uh, basically the understanding of the process change in one application, you have to have it some sort of a understanding that yes, it's change it, let's change it. So that's why you need a top down effort, which is like the governance meetings are there. That's why to take those areas of problems and ask them to fix it um, and have some business kind of like more of like a, uh, a executive by executive uh, support in order to fix these problems. Yeah. Um, fantastic. Well, we've got some more questions here, Shrad. So I'll, I'll start powering through some of these. Um, mm -hmm. We have two questions from one user. Um, the first is in respect to data governance boundaries. But the second one is about how data governance will handle internal and external data. I wonder if we could combine those two, like what the, the boundaries of data governance are and 
um, how data governance handles internal and external data to an organization? Very good question. Um, so when we talk about the boundary of the data governance, right? So I think the boundary of writing the rules and regulation is like you, you like uh, uh, in terms of like putting together objectives there, it's easier to do. Like you can put together a policy for data access. You can put together a policy of data literacy and you can put together a policy around data quality that how we will manage, how we will have these three components. But the problem comes in enforcement, right? The enforcement is the complexity when we have this boundary issue comes in. Uh, the first issue in the enforcement of access, you have to have it. I think that is a not a big problem we have seen um, because access is, is required you to, to kind of control it. But the really boundaries are in terms of literacy and in terms of like uh, quality of the data and putting together how much can be managed where. So I think we are losing Kiron for some time. So let's wait for um, him to continue. Sorry, guys. Um, seems like we have some technical difficulty here. Hi guys, I'll stop in just for now until uh, Kieran can come back. Um, you know, okay. it happens live. Let's, Let, go. let's, let's go, Kayla. So we can continue uh, here in. So we were talking about uh, internal and external data to the organization as well as what are the boundaries are. So as we were trying to explain the boundaries in internal and uh, um, basically the boundaries around like access boundaries versus quality versus literacy. Uh, the literacy boundaries are always about the enforcement of this. So how much enforcement we do it and how much we not do it. So in terms of the literacy, we generally keep it to the critical data elements, uh, which is very business to critical. Uh, and it, it all depends upon how much bandwidth the data governance team is having. Uh, again, we would love to have as many resources for the data governance, but uh, it depends always upon how, what is the budget of the organization is. And, and again, uh, ideally speaking, the, the budget of governance should be about 25 to 30% of the overall data budget. But sometimes, because people see this, oh, governance is a is a is a extra effort, but I think it's, it's a planning part of it. So so if you if you have 33% of the data budget, then then of course you can cover more in the boundaries around it. And you can cover more in the critical data elements. You can also have high quality, high data elements as well. So it's 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 that is the it's a trade off always. Uh, how much uh, and and there is a downstream impact of it. If you have managing the right definition, there is a good decision making process will happen. If you don't manage it, then obviously the decision making will be all over the place. But uh, that's the the part which you have to start at uh, at somewhere and then that's the, define the boundaries around it. Definitely, and especially with um, regards yeah. to coming up with a framework and putting in all the planning in order to have a successful data governance program, right? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. Well, let's keep on chugging with questions as we were. Uh, we're going to bring up the next one from Shopee. Uh, says, I have seen this question asked many times. We are starting to ingest data. Should we think about data governance? And if so, which use case? Very excellent question. Yeah. So when you are starting ingesting data into data governance platform, that is the right time to start thinking about various, the A, you have to think about access, that how do you will do access? The B, you have to think about literacy as well. You know, uh, how would you well, uh, how will you govern it in terms of what kind of like, uh, uh, I would say the what kind of um, definitions you will put together. Uh, putting a framework for the definition is very important. If you, because this is the right time, otherwise, if you start building the use case, you will be delayed after that. So this is a, uh, it's, it's like I'm creating a, my road infrastructure. Should I think about governance right now? The answer is yes. So as soon as you build the road, you put the lane there so that people, as soon as people driving, it happens. If you don't put the lane into the road, 
then people would drive all over the place and you will have accidents right so the same way is it's it's the it's the very first time to you should think about governance you should have a separate at least a group um, if one person should start working on the data governance initiative putting the roadmap together so that they know what to expect when you start using this data for your needs because people you will have to provide access to it so you start start thinking now that how will you provide access to other people how will you do the literacy and quality aspect of it absolutely and it's so incredibly helpful to have data governance there at the start because then you get to kind of spearhead some of the issues that a lot of organizations come up with uh, or come up against when they um, like start factoring it in and have already made progress. Uh, let's see, the next question, a little embarrassing, it's from me. Um, is there uh, any difference between various use cases by industry uh, such as like healthcare, retail, and financial? Um, there is a, um, so I think the, the foundational element remains the same, but what we have seen is um, in healthcare, there's a lot of data literacy problems because mostly the, what we have seen is uh, around in healthcare industries being, there's no regulation in place um, uh, other than PHI, it's kind of very, um, uh, it's all over the place. Different hospitals use different metrics. They have thousands and thousands of reports, et cetera. While in, in financial, there is a, it's because of the PCBS, because of the banking and the, some regulation in, in, in the banking ecosystem and comes from Fed, there is a, some sort of a discipline is there. In, in, but but the, so, so financial industry a little bit more mature than healthcare in terms of the data governance initiative. Uh, the retail is uh, uh, the retail and the financial. Okay, so, so that's why I say that it's a maturity curve with some industries are, again, not in the overall curve. There is a difference between them. But the foundational remains the same. The, there's no difference on that. It's a maturity might be different on different industry levels. Right. So more so guidepost rather than um, holy writ. Got yes. it. All righty. Uh, let's see. I do think that we are coming up close on time. So I'm sorry, guys, that Kieran dropped. We'll definitely have to have him back because that was an excellent discussion. Uh, be sure to follow the Oval Edge company page for more content. We do have a blog post about the uh, top five data governance use cases. I'll go ahead and post it in the chat right now. And again, just see you guys next time. Thank you, uh, Sharad, so much for sharing all these use cases with us, all the research that goes into this. Thank you, Kayla, and thanks, Kiron. Uh, thank you. And awesome. thank you, the audience, so much. All right, see you guys, bye. Bye.